Hi everyone, it's Gordon Burkell from FilmmakerU.com. Uh, as you probably noticed, we don't have uh, Ellen with us right at this moment. We're having some technical difficulties getting her connected to the Zoom call. So if you could just bear with us, uh, what I'm gonna do is put up that uh, sign again and we're gonna work to get Ellen connected uh, so that you can ask her your questions. In the meantime, start posting your questions and uh, we will have them ready for her when she gets on. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you soon. Oh, there she is. <laughs> there Hi, I am. Hi, Gordon. How are you? <laughs> I just skin my teeth. <laughs> I was, I'm we were very worried. well. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good, thanks. How's how's your? Uh, are you ready for the weekend? <laughs> yeah, I just ran up here. I just ran up to my upstate house. I drove uh, okay. up from downstate. So oh, wow. um, yeah, I got a lot going on on the weekend. I'm working on my chronicle series so i'm in the middle of doing the writing for that so yeah. well so, yeah speaking of your own work we actually already have our first question uh from a guy named sam Rus uh, russell and he says uh, ellen we met in kripalu if i'm pronouncing that properly fall of 2018 uh listening to david white uh now he was wondering if you ever did the doc project on him that you were playing um you know, I had thought about it and uh, I realized in order to do a documentary, uh, it wasn't going to be a documentary about David White. It was going to be kind of a, a visual poem with David White's poetry. And I realized in order for me to do that, I had to go to Ireland because so much about what David White is about and what he's inspired from and is from Ireland. Mm -hmm. So, so I actually went and met him and we talked about that. And, um, and I thought, you know, it's one thing that I have that I'm going to do in the future, for sure. Because I love David White's poetry. I think that he's a really profound speaker and, you know, a visionary. So, you know, that will happen. So I'll it's still on know. the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm doing other things, at the, you know, in the meantime. So I've been quite busy since, since that time. I... I mean, I've been working nonstop. I mean, right before the shutdown of the pandemic, I was I worked seven months almost every single day. So, so you can imagine. <laughs> was, so, what did you do during the pandemic? Well, you... before that, you know, let's we'll go back to over, over a year ago. Um, it was about mid June, and I was in. Italy and London and going back and forth because I was doing a big Apple campaign. And then I did a favor for a friend of mine. We did a bunch of interviews all over the U.S. for his Pride series. And then I did Umbrella Academy where I went to Toronto for two months because when you do a block of episodes, if you're directing, it usually is, you know, a two-month commitment. And then I went straight to London and I was doing Brave New World. So by the time I got back to the U.S. before Christmas, I was then working on a project that I always work with with Marty Scorsese about Fran Lebowitz. Mm -hmm. And then Spike and I filmed American Utopia for David Byrne, which the film now is opening um, up at uh, the Toronto Film Festival. So it was a very busy time. So by the time the shutdown happened, I was in the middle of directing a series for Netflix called Inventing Anna, which happened to be in New York. So I was very lucky because I happened to be home for the first time in, you know, seven months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I was, I have to say, you know, I was one of the fortunate people who was able to stay at home and also was able to leave the city. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have a house outside of the city. So I immediately went there. And after two weeks of being away, I, which I really enjoyed because I started reading a book for the first time in years, um, you know, I, I, my conscience started nagging at me. You know, I started thinking that, you know, all of the things that were going on in New York, all of the newscasts that we were hearing, um, all of the news that we were hearing from Italy and from Spain, I mean, it, the you know, the COVID was exacting a, a terrible toll on these countries. And then New York, of course, you know, was listing 900 people dying a day, which is an incredible number of people to pass away in one day. And I thought, oh my God, you know, it's like, I have to do something. 
and I, I have to get out there with the camera. I mean, mm -hmm. even to, to do something which is just beyond the empty streets that we see in the news, you know, to get to what's happening in people's minds, you know, what's going on in the psyche of the people. So is it like so, a documentary or? No, actually, um, well, I was going to go into the city and, and film and I arranged to get a camera and I was gonna go in with my camera assistant and my camera assistant said, well, I'm happy to come with you, but you know, I know that I'll have to go into quarantine for two months in my basement because I'm with my family and I can't infect them. And as if we remember back in that time, which was the end of March, the beginning of April, we didn't really know anything about the disease. We didn't mm -hmm. know how it was transmitted. People didn't know whether it was on surfaces, you know, whether it was transmitted through the air. They didn't know, scientists didn't know enough about it. Um, and, and even the information was political in many respects because the Chinese were, you know, putting out the information. But as we know, our administration was not wildly enthusiastic about having high numbers of people who have COVID. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so there was a great suppression of what the news was and what the real information was. And so, you know, all of this started running around in my mind and I wanted to go into the city to start filming. And I realized that I couldn't ask my assistant to do that. And also I've had Lyme disease for a long time and my friends were saying, don't do it. Don't go into the city, you know? So I thought, okay, what can I do? And I thought, well, I know a lot of people around the world. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be really important that we cinematographers, we filmmakers grasp this moment and mm -hmm. film what's going on around the world? I mean, there are no people in every single corner of the, of the world. The American Society of Cinematographers has cinematographers who live everywhere you know mm -hmm. they have affiliates called the mago which are the other cinematography societies so i made out a call and an invitation to a lot of uh cinematographers around the world and said hey maybe go out and film or film from your window or your balcony but try to capture this experience so that we can remember it so that when we look back at it we know that this pause this time that nobody ever would have imagined that would have happened. If you asked anybody in January, 2020, you know, mm -hmm. do you believe that the world would shut down? People would laugh at you. They would say, absolutely not. You know, they wouldn't believe that it would have happened, but it did happen and it continues to happen. And so, you know, so I thought we had to capture this moment in time. So, so you know, there were a, a number of people who jumped on board with me. My executive producer, Anna Hutchinson, uh, Corner Shop, where I'm directed, uh, where I'm uh, represented as director mm -hmm. um, for commercials, and Abel Cinetech that just said, "Okay, just tell us what we can do. We can give cameras to the DPs, you know, in the U.S." And Harbor Picture Works, my old friend Joe Gawler was like, okay, we're, we're in whatever we want to do. We'll do all the posts. Mm -hmm. And everybody has been working pro bono. And now we have 46 countries who are involved with directors in all the countries and DPs working together. And, and everybody's making a short film five to eight minutes long. So which all curate together into an anthology of, of this time. And you know, my thing was, is that they're not documentaries. You know, they are, um, they're, they're basically portraits of this time. You know, they're much more philosophical or they're more documentary or they're very abstract. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, each director had to come up with their own idea about how they wanted to approach this. You know, so that's what I've been doing. So I spent three months <laughs> on Zoom. Well, I had to brief everybody. So yeah. Anna and I were on Zoom basically every day for two months because oh. we would in the morning talk to Sri Lanka and then we would talk to Pakistan and then we would talk to Italy. And so we wanted to give people an idea that, you know, that this is just not about the pandemic, that it was about the bigger picture of the pandemic as, as an as part of our natural order, as part of what's happening because 
humans impact on the planet is to the point where it's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. Now, Jackie uh, wants to follow up on that question. She wants to know, how do you think COVID-19 will impact your work going forward? Well, it's impacted the entire world and, and particularly it's impacted work in terms of our proximity and being able to uh, walk into a space, you know, with, with uh, unfettered, you know, where you walk onto set and you're not even thinking about how close you are to other people or the protocols that you, you know, one needs to do in order to not infect someone. I mean, there's a certain responsibility of community that goes with um, being in society again, that is wearing a mask. And of course, all of the studios have to put into place strict protocols. So what that's gonna mean is that, you know, when we get to set, we're gonna have to have tests and someone like me may have to have a test every single day. So if I'm dealing with the actors face to face and of course, six feet apart, I may have to get tested every day because I, so that I'm not infecting someone else because, mm -hmm. The whole thing about COVID is that, you know, it's, you can be an unknowing vector of, of passing on the disease. And that's the big thing is that, you know, even if you get tested today, you know, two days from now, you could, you know, come in contact with somebody who has it and then you have it and you can pass it on to other people. So, you know, I mean, there's this huge controversy out there about, people saying it's their freedom not to wear a mask, but yeah. it completely denies the social responsibility of community. You yeah. know, it's, in, it's insanely selfish in my opinion. Yeah, well, it's, it's shocking that, someone, that people would even think that way, given the situation. Um, now, in terms of uh, your work, you're, you're directing a lot by the sounds of it. So what did you learn as a, as a DP or as a cinematographer that you've brought into your directing uh, skill set? Um, I mean, if you think about it technically, you know, as a DP, I always approach the subject matter by trying to understand what it, what the meaning is, what, what it is that the scene wants to say. Uh, what, what is the meaning of, even if you're in a documentary, you know, what is the intention of the director? What's the point of view that they're taking of this particular subject matter? Otherwise, you just shoot anything and it has no point of view. I mean, the thing about being a camera person is that for me, it was, and this is something that a lot of camera people don't consider. They, they're just looking for cool shots. They're looking for beautiful shots. But really when you're telling stories, it's really about deciding what's the point of view. It's probably one of the most important aspects of, of camera, of, and it tells you where the camera goes. Otherwise, you'll put the camera in every single uh, point of view to try and, and, and capture it just so that you can figure out what the point of view is afterwards, which mm -hmm. is, to me, you know, a, a colossal waste of time. Uh, and, and also, it's not very visionary, you know, I mean, you just... You know, just it's kind of surround coverage, but it's not getting to the point of what's the point of view. So understanding that as a director, uh, as a DP, I was able to bring that into directing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really helped a lot because when I approach a scene or when I approach an actor and the performance, it's very much about that. It's like, what's the meaning? What do you want to say with this performance? You know, what do you want to say with this blocking? What do we want to say with how we design the music or where the sound effects are? So everything has to do with meaning. Interesting. So I guess you, in that case, you would also work with the direct, uh, sorry, the writers and figure out, you know, what they had intent and bringing that all the way through uh, when you're working on a show. Yeah, well, when you're doing episodic television, you know, the writer is very much involved. So oftentimes the showrunner or mo more likely the writer will be on set, but that depends because um, when I was doing Ozark, you know, the writer was not on set. It was run very much like a movie where mm -hmm. the director is the one who's, you know, calling the shots 
Um, and the showrunner, uh, Chris Mundy, you know, he was on set maybe one day. So, and the same thing for Umbrella Academy. You know, the, I'm very fortunate because the showrunners and the, and the writers, you know, leave me to do what I know to do. But mm -hmm. I really enjoy working with the writers when I'm on set, you know, on episodic television, it's a collaboration that I was used to having as a DP with the director. So for me, it's a different kind of relationship, but um, it's, for me, it's not adversarial. For me, it's, it's a, they're a resource for me to know something about character that I didn't know before, you know, but in a movie, it's very different because the writer is no, not anywhere to be seen. You know, basically you are the director, you have the script, and then you are the one who's shaping the entire picture. Now, Janine wants to know, uh, do you have a particular film camera that you like to use? Uh, it depends on what I'm doing. It depends on the story. Always my cameras are depending upon what the story is. So if I'm shooting film, mm -hmm. um, I like smaller, more compact cameras because then I can get into, I can, I can make the camera disappear more. Mm -hmm. Because for me, it's not so much about announcing the camera. It's me, it's about, you know, making the camera invisible so the actors feel like they own the set. Um, so I would say in, in the digital world, um, <clears throat> you know, there's different cameras for different applications. So um, I've been using the Venice at times because I really like the way the Venice can have, um, they, they have a a sensor that you can detach from the camera and that you can have an umbilical cord. And so you can get really interesting shots in cars and that kind of thing. And it's an easy thing to rig. Um, you can walk handheld with it. Um, I can be really close to an actor. Um, so the Venice has its, its advantages and, um, but I'm really loving the large format cameras. I really love the way the depth of field plays. It's very painterly. And of course, the large format cameras, I mean, the 65 is just incredible. So it really depends on what you're doing and the kind of picture you want to paint. Um, <clears throat> Chris, uh, Christian Johnson wants to know, do you shoot thinking about editing while you're shooting? Always, always. Yeah. I, I, I was just, I had a master class <laughs> last Wednesday and I was for the academy. And I was saying that one of the things about you know, whether you're shooting for documentary or whether you're shooting for fiction, I'm always thinking about the editing because in, in and I'm cutting in my head already. So, mm -hmm. and that's something that's, uh, DPs sometimes don't think about, but directors have to think about all the time because you have to think about what's your coverage. Um, I'm always thinking about what the coverage is because if I'm shooting, let's say in the beginning times when I, when I first started in documentaries, I realized that if I shot wide shots of everything and did these huge, huge wide shots, the editor would never be able to cut it together because it would be wide shot to wide shot to wide shot. So as a DP, it's my responsibility to tell that story. I'm giving the editor the material to tell that story. So I, need, I know I need to get some close-ups. I need to get some coverage. So when you're in narrative, you always have to think about what's your coverage. Um, it's, it's so important as a director, I have to know, okay, I know I'm gonna be in this place at this time in this camera because I know that I want that for that line or I know I wanna be here for this. So I'm already making the movie in my mind's eye before I even get on set. And that's one thing I would say is you always should prepare really well. I always do very detailed shot list notes. I always do that. I always come prepared that day. If I don't, and I don't have an idea of the blocking, it's, you know, it gets messy and you mm -hmm. waste time and you won't make your day. And I remember I did that once on Umbrella Academy. I was like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the actors decide where they wanna go. And it was like, you know, they can't see themselves in space, mm -hmm. you know? So that's what you have to do. You have to, you know, help them to go to the places that are meaningful for that character. Which is interesting. Cause you also talked about getting the camera to almost disappear for the, 
the the actors. So how do you, as a director, work with the actors to get them to their place, to get them to that emotional moment or that emotional beat for the scene? Well, it's something that's a process, you know? I mean, you have to, first of all, you have to create that ambience on set. So just, you know, the AD needs to help you, the assistant director, in keeping set uh, under control. And so that people aren't laughing, they're not on the phones on set. I mean, you know, I don't like it when people have their cell phones on set because mm -hmm. if the actor can see them and the person, you know, the electrician or whoever is on their phone, it's like, no. It's distracting. It's like everybody, you guys, everybody off if you can. You know, it's just like give everybody room. And I tried to make it a respectful space. And then, I, you know, we spend time when we're doing the rehearsal in the very beginning. You know, like I have a really good idea of what I want to do for the blocking. And I suggest that to the actors. And then we try that. And once we then try that, they see how it feels for them. And then, we, you know, we'll do a rehearsal with ourselves. And when we're, once we're ready and they feel comfortable, mm -hmm. then we bring the crew in to show them. We bring the keys in and we say, okay, this is the blocking. This is, they're going over here. He's going over here. And actors who are very technically adept and who know their stuff, they, they're, they understand that it's, you know, we, we talk about it because everybody's part of the same team. And they, you know, the actor will say, okay, I'm gonna walk over here and then I'm gonna turn around so that the gaffer knows what they're doing so they can anticipate the lighting. Now, um, Christian wanted to follow up his question about editing. And he, uh, he's asking <clears throat> uh, how, how involved do you get in, with, in the editing process? And uh, when you're sitting with the editor, um, what are some of the things that you've uh, learned from them or suggested new ways of shooting uh, to help you in the edit later? Well, I talked to the editor pretty much in the, a lot, and I tried to in the first two weeks because I want the, because when they're simultaneously editing as we're going along, um, I want the editor to tell me, you know, are we, you know, are we lacking certain coverage? You know, mm -hmm. do we feel like we got that in, enough in that scene? It's because the editor then can tell me when they're putting schemes together, if they can say like, you know, it, if you go back into that location, I need a cutaway of this, or I need a close up of that. Can you do that? You know, so if you're still on the same set, sometimes you can go back and grab that shot or not, you know, but the editor can help to be a guide for, you know, perspective or something looking too dark or something like that, you know? Um, so there's, there is this back and forth rapport. It isn't like I give all the materials to the editor and then they're, then they have to deal with it. And oftentimes I tell the editor through the script supervisor, what my intentions are. Mm -hmm. Like I'll say to the script supervisor after a take, I'll say, I really like that take. I like the first part of the take. When the second part from this, this line on, I think it's better in the third take. So that the editor knows that that's what I'm circling because oftentimes the, the script supervisor will circle the whole take, but mm -hmm. the editor won't know which parts I'm listening for, right? Well, that sounds so, very useful yeah. as someone who's gone through that. It's yeah. very useful. Yeah, so, you know, I'm telling the script supervisor. So there was a script supervisor on a show that I was on who did not write down my notes, right? So I didn't know that until afterwards when I got into the edit room, right? Because I had talked to the editor quite a bit and then we got into shooting and then we were talking and, you know, they were doing their thing. I was doing my thing. And when I got into the editing room and I saw the editor's cut, you know, they sent me the cut, I realized that they hadn't gotten my notes. I could see, mm -hmm. you know, just by how they were shooting, they were cutting it. The way they were cutting it was, you know, they didn't have an idea of what my intention was and my perspective was. Like I could say like, I want you to cut it fast here. You know, mm -hmm. the editor can't read my mind unless I tell them what my intention is. And that's why I think it's important for editors too, to reach out to the directors and say, hey, I'm working on the scene, you know, what, what's, what do you want to, what's your intention with the scene? What's the message? 
you know, what's the, what's the takeaway? What are you going for? What's the meaning? So to give the editor an idea of the point of view. So it all comes down to the point of view, right? And the tone, the pacing, you know? So, so the thing is, is that, um, so I would write all of those notes down through the script supervisor. And when I found out that that script supervisor did not write down all of my comments, because I can give a lot of comments, I'll sit there and I'll take the time to do it. Okay, I want to do this, tell them this, tell them that, right? And when they didn't do that, I was, I called the producer up and I said, hey, because I was already done with my book. I said, the script supervisor didn't do all the things I asked the, the person to do. And I said, I'm really angry. I mean, I don't get angry, but I was like, are you kidding me? You just set us back so much. I mean, it was just, you know, not responsible. It, and it put the editor back. I mean, put the mm -hmm. editor, the editor had lost all of that information that was really valuable to the editor. And, and they said, oh, well, we already fired. <laughs> and they had already fired that person yeah. because, you know, because of that. That's part of your job is to communicate. So as editors, you know, you guys have to also be really communicative. You, I know you're in your rooms and you're back, back at the ranch, but, <laughs> you know, text your directors. Yeah. You know, when I was, when I was on Catch-22, I was in Italy and the editor was in LA, but we would find time to talk. You know, it would be really late for me or early or whatever, but we would find time to touch base to, you know, to be, you know, on the same page. Yeah. Well, and how do you, when you're in such a drastically different part of the world in the sense of, you know, you're in Italy's time zone and you've got someone in LA, um, how do you work that, that schedule and how do you make sure that the communication continues? Because you got to so figure that out with that person. I mean, last night I was on a Zoom call with one of the directors of the Chronicle series. Um, you know, I got on the Zoom call at 11 o'clock my time because Anna is in LA. So she was on at 8, 8, 8 p.m. and he was on at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. in Bhutan. So the director was in the Bhutan. So we had huge time zones to jump. Yeah. So you just, you make the time, you know, you figure out it's like, okay, you know, you're in the, you're getting into the editing room in the morning, let's talk. Or sometimes, you know, he'll send me a, a scene that he put together, you know, he'll post a scene for me. So it's, it's not a whole lot of data, you know, that mm -hmm. he's posting, but so I can take a look at that scene and then I can call him and I'd say, okay, you know, we'd have a quick chat just about the scene. Mm -hmm. And I would be like, you don't need any establishing shots. You know, this is just like you're dropping into one place to the other. It's almost like you're listening to this conversation and that conversation. So you don't need to reestablish where you are. You're just dropping in. Mm -hmm. So that was important for him to know because, you know, when you're thinking about editing, edit, you know, editing approaches, it's like, establish where the character is but I was like we don't need that and also because the comedy if you do that it takes away from the comedy yes so. well and Catch-22 was such a great show so <laughs> really yeah. enjoyed it um now uh, Stephen here wants to know what is your I guess and I'll, I'll sort of split this into two parts what is the scene you're most proud of? And he wants to know as a, as a DP, but I'd like to know as a DP, but also as a director, what are the scenes that you're most the proud scene of? scene I'm most proud of in yeah. all of the movies I've done. <laughs> <laughs> you can give us a couple um, if need be. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think, you know, there's a bunch of scenes that I really love in Eternal Sunshine. And part of that is some of the scenes that we used with the memory light. And, and, and part of that was during what I call the chase scene. When, when Kate and Jim, when Clementine and, and Joel are running away from being erased, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're running away and she's, you know, they're erasing the scene as they're going along. And mm -hmm. there's the scenes that are on the ice when all of a sudden, they're running in the ice and then they, he's on a sled and he gets pulled away from her. 
those, mm -hmm. those kind of things, those moments were really interesting to me. And then I would say also in Summer of Sam, there are a lot of scenes in Summer of Sam, some of the murder scenes, um, and also the scenes with David Berkowitz when I used the shift and tilt lenses. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to me, that made it feel very visceral and creepy. Yeah, what about as a, as a director? What are some of the scenes that you're, you're most proud of? Um, I would say the fight scene between Jason Bateman and Laura Linney in Ozark. They have a huge fight mm -hmm. over uh, one night over the, over the dining room table. And to me, that's, that was a really hard scene. It was, I had that came up the first, it was the first, it was day four of my block. So day four of shooting, which was huge. And, and uh, that was episode number seven. And both of the actors had been kind of anticipating that fight for seven episodes. So you can imagine. So when you're an episodic director, you're coming yeah. into it fresh. You don't live all those other scenes with those actors and then you have to take them to this other place. So yeah, I would say that scene. Wow. How, as, since like you said, you know, I asked you how you get the actors into place, but in this situation, you, you know, you're coming on to set, I guess, cold or fresh in the sense of you haven't been through those seven episodes. So how do you get yourself into, into that mindset too? It's, it's really challenging. I mean, it's like being up on deck when yeah. you know, the bases are loaded and there's yeah. two outs. That's what it feels like. And you're on deck and you're, you know, you know, there's, you know, you're just, you're, you're swinging the ball. <laughs> you're just at the batter's box, you know, that's, you know, it's a little nerve wracking. And, and always for me, it's kind of like the first day of school, you know, those mm -hmm. first days. And then once you get into it, you're into it, you know, then you, you know, you get to know the people around you because it's like you walk on and you don't know the crew. I'm so used to knowing the crew because the crew is my family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Umbrella Academy, I, you know, the crew for me is my family. I mean, I know them now. You yeah. know, we did the first season and now the second season, everybody's like, yeah, you know, it was like a big family. We had a fantastic time filming. Everybody loves everybody else. And, you know, it's so great. And Steve Blackman, who's the showrunner, he sets... He sets the tone, you know, and as a director, it's, it's my responsibility uh, and as a DP to set the tone on set. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my number one rule to be, you know, a good filmmaker is not to be an asshole. You know? And that yeah. applies to everybody, whether you're in the editing room or whatever, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, for me, philosophically speaking, you know, we spend a lot of time doing what we do. We live our, our work. You know, it's our passion. Mm -hmm. So don't be an asshole because, you know, the people around you, people are your family, you know. Um, so Andrea, Andrea Stewart wants to know, uh, what's your approach to working with actors? Do you tell them uh, what, uh, tell them what you think they should uh, be thinking or do you let them have it, um, have at it and sort of tweak it after they've done it? It depends on the actors. You know, some actors just like to do it. They don't like to, you know, be preempted, mm -hmm. you know, about what they're doing. I mean, I, you know, some actors want to check in and talk about character and the approach. Um, I usually do it through the blocking, mm -hmm. you know, so because, you know, the, the first time it comes out of actors, you know, for them, they're still feeling what the ground is. So sometimes they just like to be able to do it and feel it for themselves. And then you make the adjustments afterwards. Okay. It depends on the actors, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, what would you say is the toughest scene that you've had to, to shoot? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, That's a really good question. I'd have to think back. <laughs> um, I think sometimes, you know, it gets tougher when you have lots of effects mm -hmm. and, and you're dancing around, uh, you know, stuff that's blue screened or green screened and 
you know, actors having to do things uh, with air, you know what I mean? And it, mm -hmm. I think that those are the toughest moments are, you know, because you have to be, you know, you're, you're, you have to be very technical about it and, and also provide the environment for the actor to be able to feel safe and also to feel like, you know, there's, you know, they're, they're interacting with a, a live being or something like that mm -hmm. or a real space, you know? So, so that's, that's sometimes tough to do. I mean, I can't think right off the bat what's the most difficult. Mm -hmm. um, probably in the Eternal Sunshine because Eternal okay. Sunshine was, I, I would say one of, the, one of the most difficult to light was when we were on the beach was uh, when we were in the house. So you remember the house that falls apart yep. when they go to that house on the beach, right? Yep. So that house apparently was, is a very difficult location. We could not put any tape on the walls. We could not hang any lights in that location. We couldn't do anything oh, in that location, right? Yeah. I mean, the irony of it is that they filled it with sand. Yeah. You know? I mean, we didn't touch the walls. They just filled it with sand. <laughs> But also because of the restrictions on the dunes, I couldn't put any lights around the house. So how do you light the house, you know? Yeah. So, and how do you light the beach? Cause I had to light them on the beach. And yeah. I was using the, what I call the memory light, which was my, you know, bicycle light on, on the camera or it was a park in if we were outside. Yeah. But it is the one place where I told Michelle, I have to use a condor. Yeah. And I was like, I have to. I, I can't put lights on, on the beach, you know, it's, there's dune restrictions. Yeah. So it was really tricky to do that location. And he, we didn't have much time there and it was tricky to do what we did. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, there's moments there that are very beautiful, but, uh, but I have to say, I'm, I'm really amazed that I have any teeth left after this. <laughs> I was like, now, you've been more than generous with your time, and I want to thank you for that. But I have one last question for you, and that is, I, I like to, to ask this of everyone I talk to, and that's, what's your favorite guilty pleasure film to watch? Oh, oh uh, that's easy for me to watch. Rango. Oh, yeah? Rango is animation. one of my, the animation film. Yeah. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's fantastic. I love that movie so much. It's such a great Western it's mm -hmm. such great parody. It's so well crafted. Yeah. I mean, impeccably crafted. You know, the title sequence is genius. The music is amazing. I mean, Gore Vavinsky, you know, that movie should have won hands down. I mean, it's such a great movie. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the one that, you know, I talk about Rango all the time. I love the characters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for letting me interview and letting all these people ask their questions. And uh, I hope you have a good, good weekend. Good to meet you, Gordon. Yeah, good okay, to meet you. Everybody. Take care. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Bye-bye.